Thank you. Well, it's good to be here. Uh, as uh, the bishop mentioned, I, I lived here when I was a little boy. I was born in Rochester and lived in the area for several years before moving to Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and then ultimately down to Baltimore area uh, by the time I was a, a teenager. So it's, it's a thrill for me to be back in the area. And it's funny, like, being on whatever the highway is coming in with the, the fairgrounds, all of a sudden things coming about, you know, when we were little, going to the fairgrounds. And didn't they used to, did they have a racetrack there? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. So it's just, just different things. Or, you know, in the choir at Holy Family, uh, you know, we, we were on the television channel. Uh, you know, I can remember singing, Oh, Danny Boy. My voice was quite different at the time. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it's great, great to be here. So let's, let's start with a word of prayer, and then uh, I'll share with you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord, we thank you so much for the great joy of knowing you, for your great mercies and love that you've shown towards us personally, and the great urgent desire you have for all of humanity to know that they can be reconciled to the Father through you. We ask you to be with us, to bless this time, not just in terms of teaching, but in terms of change in our lives, that we might draw closer to you and to your purposes. Holy Spirit, we welcome your presence here. We just implore you to empower us that we really might make the mission of the church, the essential mission incarnated in our personal lives and in the diocese here. And Father, we just are so grateful to be your children, and we thank you through Christ our Lord. Amen. amen. So, Holy Spirit, amen. Well, what I, what I, I thought I'd do... Um, is take some time uh, to just share, first of all, some foundations about evangelization. I'm quite sure that you're all very knowledgeable and well-versed in all of this, but I thought it would be useful to sort of go over some groundwork and with a certain kind of perspective uh, that, that may be helpful uh, before we get to some more practicals um, in terms of evangelization. Now, the way I wanted to start was to make the point that over the last 50 years, there's been a consistent call from Vatican II Council right on up to Pope Francis for a great relaunching of evangelization in the Catholic Church. And I'd like to sort of highlight that point that, that, that there's been a call for this great relaunching that's been over 50 years long. And it's rooted in Vatican, uh, the Vatican II Council. And the, I wanted to quote from uh, on evangelization in the modern world to, to start with. Um, in section one, there's something that's frequently overlooked. And again, when you think about, okay, St. John Paul was calling for this great relaunching uh, and consistently uh, rooted in the, the, uh, the council, 10 years out from the council itself, uh, Paul VI promulgates uh, on evangelization in the modern world. And, uh, it, you know, it was a post-senatal uh, exhortation. That is, it was the result of the bishops meeting together to talk specifically about the whole area of evangelization. And in that first section, he says this. On this 10th anniversary of the closing of the Second Vatican Council, the objectives of which are definitively summed up in this single one, to make the church ever better fitted for proclaiming the gospel to the people of the 20th century. And the reason I'd like, I'd like to, to, to emphasize this, this particular quote, there's so many incredible statements by the, the Holy Father uh, in uh, Evangelii Nunciande, but it's, it's noting that this is the objective. The, 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 if you wanted to sum up what the council was about, it was to make the church better fitted for evangelization, for the proclamation to our contemporaries. That's, that's the point. And it's, I think, been the case that a lot of the early commentators on the council were doing it with too narrow a refocus. So things that we were comfortable with, that we're comfortable with as Catholics, tended to be focused on. So liturgical reform or sharing power among us or dialogue with world religions or ecumenism, so on. Those are things we can sort of get our heads around. But the whole thing of this idea of evangelization, 
not so much. And uh, you'll remember the famous quote from section 14 where he says, we wish to confirm once more the task of evangelizing all people constitutes the essential mission of the church. And uh, it, it, he goes on to say, that it's the reason the church exists, is to evangelize. So right from the beginning, uh, from the council, a, a clear objective was for the church to be better fitted for the proclamation of the gospel to our contemporaries. St. John Paul continued with this incredible call to evangelization. Um, in 1990, shortly after the collapse of the Soviet Union, he promulgated uh, the encyclical uh, on the mission of the Redeemer, the, on the permanent validity of the missionary mandate. In other words, saying it's still true. What Jesus commanded us to do is the, the, the missionary mandate for, for the church. And uh, in section three, he makes this incredible prophetic statement. I sense the moment has come to commit all of the church's energies to a new evangelization and mission agentis. And then he goes on and says, no believer in Christ, no institution of the church can avoid the supreme duty to proclaim Christ to all peoples. Uh, quite, quite an incredible statement. And I'd like to ask us, and I've said this with our own bishop and other bishops present, have we really committed all of the church's energies to a new evangelization and mission to the, to, to the, to the nations? But that's exactly what he was calling for in 1990. Uh, and it really is a prophetic word. So this great relaunching, you see you know, the clarion call to make the church better fitted for the proclamation of the gospel from Paul VI. Then you see the Lord, uh, St. John Paul saying, this is the moment. Now is the time to marshal all of our energies for this new evangelization and mission to the nations. And I will come back to the new evangelization briefly, and I hand it out if you want. You don't have to take them, but I, uh, a work I did during graduate school uh, on, on characteristics of the new evangelization. That's an updated version since then. Pope Benedict just continued with the same kind of call. And not only saying at the beginning of his papacy that the pri a priority was the new evangelization, but he did things to institutionalize and move things forward. So he established the Pontifical, Pontifical, Pontifical mm -hmm. Council for the, promo mm -hmm. for the promotion of the new evangelization. He called for the Senate on the new evangelization. And it's something that's <coughs> often overlooked was he called, remember the year of faith in 2012, one of the primary things the Holy Father intended was for us to understand, for us to be effective in evangelization, we have to have faith in an encounter with Jesus Christ as Lord. And one of the points of the year of faith was to help us not only understand the, the catechism and grow in, in understanding our, our faith, but at the root of it, to understand without faith in Christ and personal relationship, or as he would say, personal encounter with the Lord, there's no way we're going to go out and share it with others. So he continued to, to call us to put it into practice. You know, and then we go into Holy Father Francis. No, really, put it into practice. And I, I would like to urge you, if you haven't taken time to read the joy of the gospel, that you do that. And uh, it's lengthy, it's 55,000 words. Um, but you can, you can do it bite size. You know, maybe you just take a paragraph a day. In fact, there's some website that actually sends you an email so you can get through it in a year. It's, it's extraordinary. And when dioceses are looking for a uh, pastoral letter about where they're going and what they're doing, there's so much in here that is very personable and warm in the way he writes, understandable, uh, and extremely challenging personally and, to, and to, to the churches. It's just quite, quite a remarkable uh, statement. And if Evangelii Nunziandi in 1975 was um, the Magna Carta of the 20th century, this is the 21st century. And if we just worked on getting into, in, incarnated in the church where we are, what he's saying here, putting it into practice, it, it, would, it would just be awesome. It would just be incredible. So he really has called for a radical um, self-examination, a critical uh, examination of who we are as church, our, our identity. And um, in, in it, he starts off 
saying this in, in section one, in this exhortation I wish to encourage the Christian faithful to embark upon a new chapter of evangelization marked by this joy while pointing out new paths for the church's journey in years to come. Well, what is this new chapter of evangelization that he's talking about? And in section 27, he says, and it's, it's part of it's up there on, the, on your, in your notes, I dream of a missionary option, that is a missionary impulse capable of transforming everything so that the church's customs, ways of doing things, times and schedules, language and structures can be suitably channeled for the evangelization of today's world rather than for her self-preservation. Um, so he's, you know, he's, he's dreaming big and saying we need to look at this on every level from the papacy down to the personal lives of Catholics and, and all Christians really. Uh, so it's, it's a radical call uh, that's very challenging and it's not just fluff or just theory. He really does talk in terms of practical ways that we can examine our own conscience in terms of where we are with the mission and uh, what, what's, what's being called for among us. Now one last uh, point sort of as foundational kind of things uh, is the, the origins of the mission. And um, I regularly ask this question, you know, if there was a summary verse that could help get at the heart of the gospel and it's, it's John 3.16. And um, the reason I want to sort of end this, this first portion of uh, this talk uh, on the point of origins is that this all goes back to the heart of the Trinity and the love that God has for his creation and in a particular way for humanity. And in that John 3.16 text, it, it says so much about who the Lord is and who we are and how desperately, desperately we need to be reconciled to God. And um, the good news always comes with bad news. Uh, there is the reality uh, of, that's, that's talked about throughout the scriptures and in our, uh, the magisterial teaching that you can potentially perish. And we fight and war against uh, you know, heresy in terms of everybody's going to go to heaven. My dad just died in May. And um, he had gone from being a really fine Catholic to falling into sin, to thinking there was no hope, to saying, you live, you die, and that's it. Uh, in the last year, Ellie, my wife's here, by the way, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, she's a hairstylist, so she has this... Uh, I said they ought to get degrees in being a master hairstylist and counseling because you know I hear what goes on in terms of her chair and she gets lots of chances to evangelize people directly and to pray with them. And so my father was really open to Ellie and I actually praying with him for healing. And uh, he was sick over a year and a half ago and they told him he had two to four months to live. And a year later he only had a little pain in his shoulder and he knew <laughs> it had to do with his prayer. We're saying. Dad's, God's giving you grace to consider, you know, the reality of how much we need him and we can repent, we can change, you know. And even at the end, he was asking uh, Ellie to pray for him. I don't know with certainty where he is. You know, I hope and pray there was a turning of his heart that's in, in the hands of God at this point. But it, 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 it calls me on in the urgency of the task of the good news that God has entrusted to us in light of us receiving forgiveness and mercy to be able to help communicate that effectively to others. So, so that says it all that the Lord loves us. He loves all of humanity. The scriptures cry out, God loves you throughout all of them. And he longs for people to know that. And if I had time, I'd break it open in terms of the origins of God. But the, the, the key thing I'd like to say for today is the whole idea of our mission is it's rooted in the heart of God and it's his initiative. Everything about the Christian life is his initiative. It's all worked by grace and us making our personal response. It's the, it's the objective and the subjective. It's, it's the, the, the joining of grace. And if I get time, I'll come back to that. But um, yeah, so... Uh, Going from here, let me just say in terms of origins, the mind-blowing 
point of the Gospels is after Jesus is raised from the dead, saying to the apostles, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. Uh, that's, that's the call that we have, the missionary mandate, that we're sent to, to represent Christ and, and to proclaim the Gospel. So that's the origins. I wanted to say that. Um, what is evangelization? You know, sometimes we get sort of loosey-goosey when we talk about evangelization. We want to say it's everything and anything. Everything and anything the church does contributes to the mission or should contribute to the mission with a clarity about why we do what we do. But if you go to the glossary of the catechism, it says the proclamation of Christ and his gospel by word and the testimony of life in fulfillment of Christ's command. And, and that's an important kind of uh, sharp definition of what evangelization uh, is. Most fundamentally, it's the proclamation of Christ in his gospel. And it comes both by word and the testimony of life. You know the uh, t-shirts and the things you hear about St. Francis say, preach, what's it say? The gospel and when necessary. I, uh, our Christ Life's offices were for 18 years, just, uh, just up till this last, uh, last week, for 18 years we were at a Franciscan friary. Talking with scholars, Franciscan scholars, I can assure you, Francis never said that. <laughs> he never said it. And you can even just do a Google search and see that. But it's almost as if like it's an excuse for us as Catholics, like we just want to live the life and we don't want to talk about it. And uh, Paul VI in, in, on evangelization in the modern world, he makes the point, at some point it becomes necessary for us to tell the reason we're different. So uh, it's both word and testimony of life. And that's the two universal callings uh, of the church for all baptized, that is to, to be disciples, to be holy on the one hand, and to be on mission to, to, to evangelize. Those two go together, and they really work to, to produce greater grace and sanctity in us as we're on mission. So Pope Francis talks about missionary disciples. It's a great way of framing it up in terms of uh, the calling that, that the Lord has given to us in virtue of our baptism. Okay. <clears throat> what is evangelization? Why do we sometimes call it new evangelization? What's so new about it? Well, let, let me just... That's more detailed, and I'm sure you've heard a lot of teaching on it anyhow, but let me just mention a couple things that strike me as worth mentioning. First of all, as a kid growing up, evangelization wasn't even in our vocabulary, right? Uh, so, I mean, the, the, the closest I could get my mind around anything like that would be either A, to say that's what Protestants do, or B, uh, it's foreign missions to unbaptized people groups by missionary orders. That, that would be pretty much close. Well, everything's changed with the coming of the council because it recognized the change in the world situation and how the, world, the, the church needed to be able to, to, to become more relevant but faithful to the, the, the essence of the gospel to our contemporaries, to be able to do it in ways that would communicate effectively the love of God in Christ Jesus. And um, so um, it's new in that now the, 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 the mission fields are anybody and everybody in the pews, as well as those who've dropped out, you know, lapsed Catholics and other Christians, as well as the unbaptized. It's all of them. And if I had time, I'd break it out in terms of John Paul's teaching on, uh, in the Mission of the Redeemer about that, as well as Francis in Joy of the Gospel. But the, 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 the key thing is to recognize it's anybody and everybody. And when John Paul talked about the new evangelization, a, a big part of the stress was on the need to re-evangelize Christians who've dropped out, who aren't living a lifestyle uh, that's, that's based on Christ. So um, it's, it's the mission field is, is right in your, your home, in your neighborhood, in your workplace, uh, in, the, in the church itself. Uh, who does it? Um, everybody that's, that considers themselves a Christian who's been baptized is called to evangelize. Okay? So that's, what's, uh, that, that's two points of the newness. The, the mission field, who does it? And then the third point 
is pretty simple, and you don't see this in much of the magisterial teaching, but I think it's worth, worth saying. It's new because it's utterly new to us as, as Catholics. It's, again, going back to the point of that's what Protestants do. I was teaching at Penn State uh, University doing a seminar for Catholics on evangelization many years ago, and this man, young man came up to me and he said, uh, I know you're going to teach on evangelization, but I was with my Catholic men's group last night, and when I told them I was coming to hear a talk on evangelization, they say, well, we don't do that. <laughs> the great relaunching of evangelization, uh, the need for us to keep on pushing into it. Um, I'll come back to this, but we really have to get over this thing about talking about it being Protestant because it's biblical, it's New Testament, and uh, the Magisterium is very clear on it since the Council on uh, that this, this is what we do as Christians. So I'd say the new thing is it's new for us as, as, as Catholics, and if we can take a humble posture and say, we really don't know how to do this, or let's get personal, I don't know how to do this. If we play, take a place of, of humility toward the Lord, that, that's the place to be. That's where we want to be, um, is just to be humble. It, what, it hasn't been taught in our seminaries, and I'm not just talking about the theology of the new evangelization, but practical evangelization. How do you do this? That hasn't been taught. It's just now in a few seminaries starting to, starting to happen. Um, it's not taught in uh, how do you evangelize in most parishes. Uh, so it's, it's utterly new, and, and the learning curve really is going to be pretty substantial for us to, to get going. How you doing? So that, that's a few things uh, about sort of characterizing the new evangelization just for the sake of jumping into um, where, I, where I'd like to go. What formed, uh, oh, I'm sorry, let me just mention a couple other things about the new evangelization. In the first time that uh, St. John Paul talked about new evangelization, uh, he, in Port-au-Prince, he talked about it being the evan new evangelization being new in ardor, methods, and expression. I wanted to touch on this because this is another area that, that can easily uh, cause us to resist what the Lord wants to do in us personally and in our parishes and dioceses. When, <clears throat> when the popes have talked about ardor or impulse, frequently they're talking about the ardor that's the Holy Spirit. Uh, John, uh, St. John Paul and Mission of the Redeemer devoted an entire chapter to the Holy Spirit, the principal agent of evangelization. Pope Francis in Joy of the Gospel, the last chapter is called Spirit-Filled Evangelizers. Um, and John XXIII in convening uh, the, the council, some of us are older enough, enough to remember this, he asked at Sunday Mass that we end with a prayer for a new Pentecost in the church. Um, so, you know, throughout there's this calling to recognize the need for Pentecost for a new evangelization. <coughs> the, mission of, the missionary church was birthed at Pentecost, and we need the power of the Holy Spirit. And it can't be sort of kept in a box or in our minds, you know, sort of tucked away as the third person of the Trinity it's not an experiential reality for us. And this is an area where I just urge you, if your, your hackles get up, you get sweaty palms, and you think, you know, I know some you know, Catholic charismatics who are crazy, and you write it off on that basis, let me, let me give you something to think about. John the Baptist, this huge movement occurs out at the River Jordan. All kinds of people are coming out there. Wouldn't you suspect that maybe there was a few flaky people coming out? to follow John. The, so you remember when the scribes ask, ask Jesus, by what authority do you do this? Remember that? You remember what he said? Let me ask you a question. Was John's baptism, was it of heaven or was it of man? And they said, well, we better not deal with that, you know. So here, here's what I would like to ask you. If you know you get a, a resistance to the whole area of the Holy Spirit and the idea of how much we need Pentecost, like the early church, I would urge you just to pray. Just note, yep, I know that's, that's a problem for me. Because we desperately need the supernatural power of, of heaven to come upon the church, especially in our age with what's going on. And I mean universally. 
You've got ISIS and what's going on with so, so many Christians by the thousands being persecuted, some martyred. And here we have a secular culture that is becoming increasingly hostile, uh, where, where persecution is not uh, you know, just some far-fetched idea. We need the power of God in our lives. And one of the reasons I want to mention that is in evangelization, Jesus trained not only the apostles, but the 72 to go out to proclaim the, his central message, the kingdom of God is at hand, the rule of God, with power, with casting out evil spirits, with healing the sick, raising the dead, and so on. He expected that was the equipping his disciples would have. And we need power because so many of our contemporaries need a transrational demonstration of the gospel that goes beyond just the intellectual, that actually pierces to the heart with the truth of the gospel. So enough, enough on that. New in methods and expressions. Uh, there's lots that, lots that could be said about this. Um, but I just wanna, wanted to raise methods and expressions really should reach down into our staff uh, at the chancery level and at our parish levels about how we do business. And I'll, I'll come back to that. But the Lord really wants to have a trans, transformational kind of impact on the way we think about doing business as church. And that's part of what you see repeated in Pope Francis' Joy of the Gospel, is the radical change that's necessary for us to be able to be missionary. Okay. Um, that's probably enough. New in methods and expressions, there's lots of ways that we need to learn to do things uh, that have some key elements of, of, of uh, the new evangelization. I'll come back to them, but there really needs to be new, newness in terms of the social media, uh, the kind of things that we do as parish to reach out to people making access doors in addition to mass. Mass was never intended to be the front door. We need to think about how do we evangelize people in our, our, our locality. Um, and I, the, the Christ Life series that we do, and I can mention briefly some things about that at the end, is, is a new method of getting the, the, the parish mobilized uh, to evangelize. So we need to, to think about the new, new methods and expressions as well. Uh, what form does it take? Um, it's, the, the new evangelization needs to be personal and relational. Um, and I, I just mentioned a few things about this. Uh, l let me start by, you've got a, a part of this quote from Pope Benedict. He says this, the first apostles, like today's, were not heralds of an idea, but rather witnesses of a person, Christ. Evangelization is no more than a proclamation of what has been experienced and an invitation to enter into the mystery of communion with Christ. So he talks about it on a very personal, relational level with the Lord Jesus himself, that that, that be something that is the basis. And again, as I mentioned, in the year of faith, one of the things he wanted to do is draw people's attention to where am I in my faith in Christ? Because without that encounter, who wants to talk about it? So, um, and then let, let me share one other thing on the personal relational level. It's personal in terms of this encounter with Christ for ourselves. It's also personal in the dynamics of how we do it in sharing with others about our faith. This is from uh, Joy of the Gospel 127. Today as the church seeks to experience a profound missionary renewal, there is a kind of preaching which falls to each of us as a daily responsibility. It has to do with bringing the gospel to the people we meet, whether they be our neighbors or complete strangers. This is the informal preaching which takes place in the middle of a conversation, something along the lines of what a missionary do does. It means Being a disciple means being constantly ready to bring the love of Jesus to others, and this can happen unexpectedly in any place, on the street, in a city square, during work, or on a journey. So there's this personal awareness and sensitivity of the fact that it's God's initiative. I'm his servant, his disciple, his child, and I'm open to these opportunities that may arise where I have an opportunity to actually 
talk about my faith and explicitly at times to talk about Jesus Christ. Now, how many of you know that experience where something just pops up like that, where you have a divine, I call it a divine appointment? A lot of us. And that's something that has to become more a normal part of our life where we're expecting and looking for those chances to occur. And I, I call them divine appointments. You know, I think of John 4 where uh, the, the Jesus, you know, is trekking up from Jerusalem, uh, going up north to Galilee, and uh, they stop f for lunch, and the boys go off to Subway, and he's sitting there minding his own business, and here comes this lady who shouldn't be coming out at noontime to draw water. She ought to be doing it in the morning. And he reads her mail, knows what's going on. What does he do? He says, you know, you lousy sinner, get away from me. You know, no. You know, he engages her in a compassionate dialogue that draws her deeper and deeper until he's able to reveal that he is the Messiah, the promised one. And then as a result, she becomes this evangelizer who runs back to the village where she probably has had a very hard time, doesn't care, and tells everybody she met someone who may be the Messiah. Uh, that, that was a divine appointment, even in the Lord's life. You know, it's, it's the, the change of schedule where he was able to move. Think of Zacchaeus in Luke uh, 19, you know, the tax collector. You know, the whole thing that happened there, this encounter with the Lord where everything is reversed, where the, the Son of God is down on the ground and the sinner is up in the tree looking down. And yet in humility, the Son of God is able to name him by name and tell him to come down relationally to come to his home. And this radical, radical conversion occurs. So we, wa we want to look for these opportunities knowing it's God's initiative. He can bring us into divine appointments that are significant for people. And it's, it's really, like when I drop out of bed in the morning onto my knees, I just say, I'm yours. I, you know, I've got my schedule planned, but if you have interruptions to the schedule, I'm yours. And uh, it's an exciting way to live life. And it's for the sake of so many people who don't know him. Okay. Um, are you there? Yep. <laughs> okay. Um, along with this personal relational dynamic, personal relationship with Christ, relational in terms of people that we meet, um, it's also the proclamation of the kerygma, the, the essence, the, the, the announcement of this good news that God loves us and has revealed himself in Christ and by his death and rising has made it possible for us to be reconciled to the Father and empowered by the Holy Spirit to live a whole new life that we, that, that we receive in baptism. And I'll come back to the thing about the kerygma but this whole point that Pope Francis makes in Joy of the Gospel, he has a whole section devoted to the kerygma. And uh, there needs to be a great return to the kerygma in the word of the ministry as it occurs for individuals out on the streets, out in the marketplace, in catechesis, and also in the homiletics. It's got to be a radical change that occurs in that whole area. And I'd advise you, if you're interested, look at the kerygma section uh, in, uh, in Joy of the Gospel. Okay, what's the aim of all this? Uh, it's conversion of heart, transformation, not just information, and bringing people into a relationship with Christ and his church. That's what we're aiming for. John Paul has a, a great quote in Mission of the Redeemer, number 46. He says, conversion means accepting by a personal decision the saving sovereignty of Christ and becoming his disciple. I was in a place uh, out in Colorado, State University a number of years ago and I was meeting with this evangelical Christian who was a professor there and we were talking about our faith and he, he clearly understood I was Catholic and I said let me share with you a quote uh, and you try to guess who it is so I he said this one from Mission of the Redeemer conversion means accepting by personal decision the saving sovereignty of Christ and becoming his disciple and he goes Billy Graham I said no Pope John Paul no kidding, really? <laughs> right at the heart of it. Conversion means uh, accepting by a personal decision the saving sovereignty of Christ and becoming his disciple. There's a really nice way of communicating what it's about. And it happens by the power of God. This tr the transformation that we want to see is the, the power of the gospel. 
And teaching on all kinds of subjects is, is one thing, and, and, and there's many areas that are really important to teach on. But when it comes to the gospel and the kerygma, actually being able to proclaim who Jesus is, what he's done for us by his death and rising, you know, and by the, the giving us the Holy Spirit and this call for a personal response, uh, it's what changes people from the inside out. There's nothing like it. Uh, nothing at all that, that comes close to it. Um, I'm going to show you something pretty cool. <clears throat> uh, Ellie uh, used to work at this hair salon, and uh, there was a Vietnamese woman there uh, who did nails, and Ellie got, befriended her, and it, this lady shared with her how her son was in a public school, and uh, he was bullied. And so what he did was, uh, or what she did was, she learned from some friends, you ought to send him to a Catholic school. You know, it'll be better, hopefully. Mm -hmm. uh, so she goes to the local Catholic parish, and they tell her you have to be a member of the church to be able to have your son go to the school. So she goes through RCIA, she's baptized, she becomes a Catholic. Ellie meets her after all of this, and it's clear she doesn't know the Lord, she knows nothing about this encounter with Christ. And uh, she suggests that at the parish she goes to, they're going to have the Christ Life series, Discovering, Following, and Sharing Christ. So this woman goes through it. At the end of Sharing Christ, the last of the courses, which is teaching you how to share your faith in Christ one-on-one, -on -one, at the very end of it, at a retreat, we have what's called cardboard testimonies. And you simply write up some point of transformation in Christ. So on one side of the sheet, you say, you know, I was this, you know, flip it over, and now I'm this, that kind of thing. It's extremely powerful. Uh, so here's, here's what this lady does. Now, she had gone through RCIA, uh, you know, was in the church. She says to Ellie and I, I didn't even know what Catholic was. Even though she's gone through all of this, she doesn't get it. So she says this. She holds this up at the Sharing Christ. I had no faith. And then she flips it over. But now I found Jesus. And this lady was radically changed interiorly. She was transformed. Now she, she started to have a hunger for learning about what the church teaches. And the church teaches in the general directory on catechesis. Conversion has to happen first for catechesis to be effective. Paul talks in, I think it's second, uh, 1 Corinthians Chapter 2, he talks about the spiritual man cannot discern spiritual things. And yet we bring people into these different levels of catechesis when they're not converted, and all it does is it remains up there. We need form intellectual formation, but without the conversion, there's not a hunger and a, an ability to discern spiritual things. So... That transformation, we want it to be an interior change where people are changed from the inside out, where it's not just a moral thing where they're trying externally to be whatever people think they should be. But there's a transformation that's happening in Christ that gives them a great hunger for, for a change. I'll share uh, real quickly here a couple things uh, from my own life. Um, Fourth, I, I was raised in a good Catholic family. Went to, we went to Mass. We said grace together. I learned night prayers from my dad. Uh, in the 60s, uh, in 64, we were gathered to watch the Ed Sullivan show. And uh, these four mop head guys come on from Liverpool, and I said, that's what I want to do. And uh, immediately learned to play guitar and was in rock and roll bands and had the long hair and everything. In 1970, four witnesses came into my life, some of them had been there all along, but four witnesses that were evangelizing me. My grandmother, Irish grandmother, who lived with our, my family, pulled me aside one day and said she was very concerned for my life and uh, she was going to pray three rosaries a day for me. That right there should have been enough to know I was going to be busted. Uh, that was the first thing. Intercession, really critical for evangelization whether it's being done as a, a diocese or a parish or individually, like uh, St. Monica. Mm -hmm. Second thing that happened was my mom and dad were involved in a, a Bible study at Loyola Col College in Baltimore. And one night my mom came home and she said to me, would you like to read the New Testament? And I was at a point of hunger 
things were not going the way I thought they were supposed to go if I followed a certain, uh, certain path. And so I, I took the, the, the New Testament and I consumed it. I just consumed it. And especially poignant to me was, were the Gospels. I, just reading the Gospels for the, the whole New Testament for the first time, but reading the Gospels and seeing the loveliness of Jesus and his compassion and mercy towards sinners was just, it just undid me. So that was very significant. Third thing that happened, a friend who's now a bishop, he was new, he had just been ordained a year before, and um, when I'd go to Mass with long hair and tie-dye shirt, the uniform, the hippies we, we, we wore at the time, uh, I'd get scowls and judgmental kind of faces from people. This young priest reach out, reached out to me and befriended me. And he made no bones about my attire or what I was looking for and got me involved in some things. And that had major impact on me, that this priest would just treat me like I was normal. I wasn't exactly normal, by the way, but <laughs> I'm still not quite normal. Uh, but but that, that friendship that developed was very, very significant uh, in my conversion. The fourth thing that happened was a young man who was a fellow hippie, uh, who was not raised and ba not baptized as a Christian, was converted and became a Christian through the witness of an elderly Baptist uh, man. And uh, he had a set of us over to his house one evening and basically shared, Jesus changed my life and he can change yours. And I had been trying to change my life and I couldn't get out of things because of the environment I was in with different people. It was very difficult to get out of it. And I knew he had changed. I was just absolutely clear that his life had been changed. His face looked different. I mean, he had joy. He never had joy. I had peace. You know, it was, it was a witness of his life changing. But he was attributing it to Jesus. I'm like a fool as a young, you know, hard, hardly Catholic, you know, cultural Catholic, trying to argue with him from the limited theology I had. But the damage was done because of the testimony of his life and the fact that he talked about Jesus that way. And three months later, March 1971, I uh, called him up on the phone and, and said, I want what you have. I don't know how to do it. And uh, he said, come on out. And he told me to get down on my knees. And uh, he said, you just pray out loud to Jesus. Pray a prayer to Jesus. And I prayed a prayer that was simple as Jesus helped me. And it was a prayer of repentance and, and need. And uh, I experienced such power and presence of the Holy Spirit. This is totally out of any kind of context. Um, but the fruit of it, more than the, the experience, was loved by God. I knew I was loved by God. I knew I was forgiven my sins. I went to confession shortly after that. But I knew I was forgiven my sins. I had a hunger for Scripture. Now when I was reading the Scriptures, it was coming alive. I wanted the sacraments. It was a whole different perspective on the sacraments, on the Eucharist, the reality of the Eucharist. I wanted to pray, and I don't mean just the prayers of the church as important and, and valuable as they are, but I wanted just to be with God and learn how to do that. And this was all fruit, and I wanted to tell anybody and everybody, I thought like, man, this is like a fairy tale. Why isn't everybody Christian? I mean, I couldn't get it. If you know that you're loved by God and your essential identity is that you're His and this is what He's done for you, why wouldn't you tell everybody? Right? <laughs> <laughs> this is the beginning and this is the key to the joy of the gospel. The joy of the gospel fills the hearts and lives of all who encounter Jesus. Joy of the gospel fills the hearts and lives of those who encounter Jesus. Those who accept his offer of salvation, that, that is, there's a response, you accept it, are, are set free from sin, sorrow, inner emptiness, and loneliness. And I could say, see, all of the above. With Christ, joy is constantly born anew. And then he goes on to encourage all of us as Christians to renew that commitment to Christ. So 
that's, that's an important part of that transformation and the fact that it really is meant for every one of us. Um, I'm going to switch by here so we have some time for conversation. But in our Discovering Christ course, that's the first of these three courses that we do. Uh, it's charismatic. It's meant to, in a relevant manner, communicate the gospel to anybody and everybody. So it can be unbaptized people like Amy, Ellie's friend, uh, or it can be, as was the case uh, down in Poughkeepsie, an 80-year-old retired Catholic high school teacher who was faithful all of her life but never knew anything about the fact that you could have a living personal relationship with Christ as Lord. Never knew that. Now at 80, she's just thrilled at that reality. I just wanted to share with you some things to think about in your own, own life and in the ministries that you're involved with, whether it's at the chancery level or in parishes. This whole thing of uh, personal encounter, personal intimacy, personal friendship, relationship with Christ is essential for evangelization to work. It's consistently been a theme of all the papal teachings since the council and yet it's an area that we get resistant to. And part of it is that post-Reformation blues where there's the knee-jerk reaction that that's evangelical or that's Protestant. And um, what I'd like to urge you to, 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 to reflect on and pray, pray about in your own life is if that causes you heartburn to ask the Lord to help you discern why is it that that's the case. Uh, because it really is the joy of the gospel. That's, that's what makes us want to share the, the gospel with others. And um, so it's, you know, it's, it's, it's biblical, as I said. You know, think of Paul in Galatians 2.20. He's talking about being crucified with Christ. The life I live is no longer mine, but it's Christ who lives in me. And then he goes on. He says, for the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So he understood this personal relationship that does not privatize it, but is essential for the sake of the whole church. It's in the context of the church that we live this relationship. But when we get into thinking like, oh, you, you, it's talking too privatized, you know, it's, it's not talking about it in a Catholic sense. It's not true. I have a dear friend who's now retired. He's a bishop, Bishop Vic Gallione. And um, he used to be on a, a, our board of directors for Christ Life. And he, he was telling me about this young man uh, who had just recently joined his church. The, the, the young man had been raised as a Catholic, gone off to university, was evangelized by a Protestant evangelical uh, ministry, came to faith in Christ, and was so angry that nobody in the Catholic Church ever said anything about having a relationship with Christ or how to do it. And I'll come back to that point. It's very important. And when he had, you know, started having children, he decided to go back to the church. He needed more. He needed the sacraments and so on. And Bishop Vick's comment to me was, they have stolen our thunder. Proper perspective. When we get into this thing about that's Protestant, no, it, it's, it, it's way before the Reformation. And his point was, thank God that someone is proclaiming the gospel, fully explaining the whole point about encounter with Christ. It goes on to be much more than just that. But it's the starting point. When I was a boy, my family would drive down from Baltimore to Florida. And <clears throat> back in those days, uh, slightly after horse and carriage kind of time, but, <laughs> but 95 wasn't completed yet. And so you'd go through these rural areas, and there'd be these houses that had all kinds of stuff that charitably you would call lawn decorations. I mean, you name it, everything. Uh, gnomes and windmills and pink flamingos, my favorite. Uh, there was so much junk on the lawn sometimes you couldn't figure out how to get up to the house. And then to make things even worse, there was so much stuff on the front of the house, it was hard to figure out where the door was. And sometimes, it's a, it's a poor illustration, but sometimes we are so concerned about the treasures and truths of the church, the doctrines of the church, that we want to get that out there first. And it obscures the person of Christ that it's all about. And so we need to be able to start with first things first, put the horse before the cart, 
the only foundation, Paul says, is Jesus Christ. And with, with the foundation of Christ, the person of Christ, all the beauty of the treasures in teaching the church comes to life and is meaningful. So uh, we, we have to be able to get over that. And we have, uh, you know, historically we have so much uh, in terms of our theology, the, the doctrines of the church, the treasures of the church, that sometimes it's a disadvantage to, to evangelical churches because this is just what they share. This is it about Christ and, and the Lord as Lord. But we want to get into a place of recognizing that's the starting point. It always has been the starting point. Read the lives of the saints and see how much this relationship with Jesus is critical to all of them. So I just urge you, if there's, what I'm trying to do is offer that there may be a need for a paradigm shift for some of us to get over that, and it's urgent that we be able to get over it. Paradigm shift is a change in our thinking, you know, our, our mindset, and another way of talking about it is Greek word metanoia. You're familiar with that? That's what a paradigm shift is. Sometimes we really need to repent, stop going one way and say, there really is the church, the magisterium is clearly talking about this. I need to get in sync with this. What does it mean for me? Now, in terms of this obstacle about personal relationship with the Lord, let me just theologically sort of flesh out something that's important in terms of Catholics and lapsed Catholics. And that's, this is one of the reasons discovering Christ, the, course, the first course we do, has been very significant for, for Catholics. What I would say about what happened to me when I was 20 years old, when I had this encounter with the Lord, with his love, where I knew his mercy, and I experienced power to live differently. The, 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 stuff I, the sinful stuff I was involved with, I was able to get free, not by willpower alone, but primarily through the grace of God in my life. What I would say was it was a renewal of the sacraments of initiation, particularly of baptism. And what I'd like to offer to you is that most of us are baptized as infants and your parents your, and sponsors stand in the place of faith for the reality of, the, of what's going to happen, grace and response, sub, objective and subjective come together. There really needs to be the response to the grace. In, the problem is that we now, now face is that we've got lots of people coming up wanting their kids baptized who aren't living a Christian life, right? I mean, this is a no-brainer. Grandpa wants his son to get the grandchild baptized. The, the son is not living anything about a, a Catholic life, and yet they're, they're baptizing this kid. Theologically, pastorally, the reason for us to be able to baptize is that there's an environment in the family and the parish that supports the faith maturing in the child. Ain't happening. I mean, it's really an issue of theological or sacramental abuse. We really have to examine that. Furthermore, for myself, I understand what I did was I made a renewal of my baptismal covenant by saying yes to Christ. Go back to the uh, statement by John Paul. Conversion means accepting by personal decision the saving sovereignty of Christ. That's what happened for me was actually a renewal of my baptism. That's my understanding theologically that I came to. Listen to this to, 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 to sort of bring it home even more. Three, four hundred years ago, one of our most traditional saints, St. Louis de Montfort, in, in, in true devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary, number 127. You want to check it out. I'm just not making it up. Listen to, listen to what he says back then in terms of a pastoral problem at that point. Is it not true that nearly all Christians prove unfaithful to the promises made to Jesus at baptism? Isn't that striking? Is it not true that nearly all Christians prove unfaithful to the promises made to Jesus at, in baptism? Where does this universal failure come from if not from man's habitual forgetfulness of the promises and responsibilities of baptism and from the fact that scarcely anyone makes a personal ratification of the contract made with God through his sponsors. Isn't that incredible? I mean, that's, that's a statement for the church today. 
Pope Benedict back in 2008, let us rediscover, dear brothers and sisters, the beauty of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Then he goes on, let us be aware again of our baptism and our confirmation, sources of grace that are always present. So the same, same point about the need for renewal. So in terms of obstacles for the church, I think that this whole area of personal conversion that comes in a, a, a decision for Christ needs to be made uh, for many, many Catholics. They have to be led to understand you can have this union, this encounter, intimacy, friendship with Jesus Christ as Lord. And then you have to be able to tell, how do you do it? It's not enough to say you can do it. We presume, you can't presume anything with people sitting out in the pews. But we need to be able to say, this is a reality, this is what Christ died for, to bring you to rec be reconciled and know the Father's love personally, and this is how you do it. And you make a, a prayer of commitment. You know, you help people to make that kind of prayer. And then it can't just stop there. It's, it's got to go on. So that's, that's an important area. Um, I'll just I'll wrap up by just saying a few more things about obstacles. Catechesis without conversion doesn't work well, and that's being charitable. Um, so we, we need to put an, a, a, a focus on deliberations, discernment about how do we get this working right in terms of evangelization so the personal conversion really leads into catechesis. Some people use the Discovering Christ uh, course as the pre-catechumenate in RCIA. They want to start with ensuring that we've at least given people a chance. Uh, some people are using it for different sacramental uses. And for, just as an example, uh, one of the churches, uh, parishes uh, down in Poughkeepsie, they, they, uh, the director of faith formation with the, the pastor in agreement decided that they would say all parents who are having their children sacramentalized must go through discovering Christ. And uh, they, they, because they realized this is crazy. The kids are going to first confession, and the first thing they're saying is, my parents don't go to Mass. So they're trying to swing things around in terms of how do we get this, this working. Um, okay. Uh, I'll, I'll just share two other uh, important areas to consider in terms of obstacles. Uh, communio or communi community. We, we, the church is meant to be the people of God, the family of God. We're meant to be brothers and sisters in Christ. And the Lord desperately wants to see a transformation at the level of uh, central services of dioceses and in the parish staffs, where it really becomes more of a relational model, where we're able to converse about Christ, we're able to start meetings with genuine prayer and not just as an afterthought that we're supposed to do this because we're Catholic, but we're genuine, genuinely dependent on God uh, in, in our deliberations and we want his presence and we want his wisdom for what we're doing. And I'm not, I'm not negating, there, there are many of us that do that, but in many situations that I know of, that's not the case. And we want to be able to relate as brothers and sisters. We did a Discovering Christ course uh, in our own archdiocese for central services. We did, I did training for our bishop and his uh, chancery staff, and then we did Discovering Christ for, the, uh, for anybody who wanted to come from central services. And one of the things they said was, in the small groups, we have a meal and we share in small groups, and then we have conversation after the teaching. And one of the things came up was, I've never talked like this about my faith in the Lord here in the chancery. And it became, it's so easy to drift into being a business rather than you know, being brothers and sisters who are on mission together fulfilling the service to, to the church you know, in, a, in a given area. So that area of relationship uh, is critical to be restored. I've got thoughts I can say about that. And finally, just the obstacle of not knowing how to evangelize one-on-one, -on -one, that this is a critical area of deep need in the church, uh, and it's not that hard. You know, if there's the transformation of heart, if we really experience the love of God personally, uh, or renewal of that, uh, that it can happen. Okay, I wish I had more time. I, I know this is getting long. Um, la if the last, last sheet you've got there is a, a quote from Aparacita that sums up 
some of the key elements of the new evangelization and some of the obstacles I just hit upon. Uh, if, you read, if you get a chance to read the document from uh, uh, done at Aparacita, it's, it's supposedly the chief editor was our, our pope. And it's got so much of the same language as Joy of the Gospel. But he says this, the first invitation that Jesus makes to every person who has lived an encounter with him, note, lived an encounter with him, is to be his disciples and so as uh, to follow in his footsteps and be part of his community so that we may share our lives with him and be sent forth to continue his mission. So you see this thing about encounter with him, discipleship, the community, and being sent forth on mission. Those are key elements that are consistently in the teaching on the new evangelization. And they're some of the things we try to do in the Christ Life series.